efficient? Yes, well, first of all, the, um, there are two new commissions as well, but um, putting those aside for a minute, there are uh, three films and one group of photos, and the reason I chose these particular works was because they all have a distinct relation with each other, and uh, you see um, both ideas and actual motifs recurring in the works, and I um, even reused one of the films and another one of the films you'll see. So they're actually kind of in dialogue with each other in the show. Mark, would you like to comment on that? You've been in, alongside this selection and also we have, we're very proud, the ICA and Bergen Kunsthal, that we have managed to commission one new work for this exhibition, uh, Jack Straw Castle, Castle. But maybe you could comment a little bit on the totality of the show. Um. Well, there's one nice uh, coincidence which I thought I'd mention, which was that um, when uh, Aneta Chirolf and I curated uh, Momentum, not the last recent one, but the one before that, we included Rosalind's work in that show. Um, and the piece that we had in there was the film Eyeballing, which is actually in many ways the chronological start point for this exhibition. So I think there's a nice circularity in that um, and that it's an extraordinary piece and I read that as something of a, a kind of a, a break or shift in Rosalind's work and then there's been this extraordinary surge of activity since that time and I think what this show does and why I was so pleased with it and the timing of it is I think it really allows people to get a sense of what this this kind of surge of activity has been about, and there's an extraordinary cycle of experiment going on within these works, um, and yet people might have had a chance to see one or two, but really to kind of see this group together, I think, is a very uh, important thing. Um, maybe it's time to actually then say what eyeballing is a little bit about. Could you explain that work to the audience? Um, Eyeballing is a film I made in 2005. I was in New York for six or seven months on a residency. And uh, I filmed a little bit every few days or every day, a few minutes, um, for about six months. And I was looking for specific things, um, one of which was um, sort of arrangements in architecture or objects um, that resembled a face so that if I framed with the camera in a certain way the viewer might project onto what they saw a face and the other aspect of the film is NYPD cops in uniform obviously outside sort of hanging around outside the first precinct in Tribeca in New York um, I filmed them in the time that where they were changing shifts so they were sort of a lot of just hanging around um, doing nothing kind of looking looking around them um, so it brings together these two aspects and it's really in a way a film for viewer projection as it's the viewer who makes the faces in collaboration with me by the framing of the camera and then um, making this connection or pr sort of um, questioning the meaning between this um, collage of two elements of the cops in uniform and this very much reduction of the face to three points um, I had my sort of reasons f why I did it, but in, in showing the film, there's been so many different interpretations on what this two, the, the marriage of these two things means to people that it's really become more of a film for viewer projection. Why are you so interested in this, you know, many of your films actually goes into sort of social communities and often male communities. You have been on a tank ship or a cargo ship filmed there and you have also these cops and what, how come you, you like to sort of break into this entity of, of human? Um, I think that on the one hand I'm interested in single sex communities in general so you know before 2005 I did do quite a few works with, with more female communities or groups I think the um, single sex society is interesting to me as a place where um, all the roles are sort of played by the one side. So there's this missing aspect 
and that's accounted for. So I, I'm very interested in, in kind of role playing. So in a single sex community, there's, there's definitely bread for role playing. And on the other hand, I'm interested in sort of interfering where I shouldn't be, probably. And because I'm a woman, therefore, it's quite interesting to look at all male communities. And um, I, you know, I haven't really got to the bottom of why that is. And then this idea of performance and role playing is obviously introduced in what's the very first work in the sequence of works here, which is actually one of the two newest pieces, which is in rehearsal, which is a sequence of images um, shot in this rehearsal in Berlin uh, for a contemporary opera that's um, kind of like a collage of fragments of Mozart operas, if that's correct. Um, and there's a, yes, there's a sequence of images, but also you can hear the soundtrack of the rehearsal. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that piece. Um, yeah, this, uh, I've been interested in rehearsals because um, I really enjoy this aspect of being in character and being yourself and crossing between the two. Um, and all of my films have touched on that. Or not, uh, Yes, to some extent, all of my films have touched on that. The moment where we are inhabiting what we think is ourself and the moment where we step into a role, whether that be in our jobs or whether that just be a certain awareness of how we appear in the world. And rehearsal's interesting to me because there's a, a playful and analytical aspect to that. So you can be in character, whether it be a Shakespeare play or whether it be an opera, and be sort of, you know, delivering your, you know, singing in this incredible register or speaking in a, in a different register as a character and then suddenly stop and say, but is that right? And did I mean that? Or does he mean that? Or does he, you know, is he saying this because of X about your own self? So that has always interested me. And um, I knew this opera director, so I decided that that would be an interesting thing and to, to go and watch. And in this case, I decided to do photographs and sound instead of film. Um, because I again I wanted the sort of gap the missing part which would be you know the movement that could be perhaps provided by the viewer when you watch this sequence of images or look at this sequence of images and hear the sound that you somehow animate the the characters that you see it's actually on here now this is the in rehearsal that you'll see soon and then well obviously the core of this exhibition is a, a sequence of 16 millimeter films. Um, and film is obviously at the core of your work, but there is another photographic piece in this exhibition as well, which is actually in the second room that people will encounter. Um, and this is two photographs from a sequence called Abbey's. And these are um, appropriated images um, of kind of uh, ruins of monastic buildings. Um, which Rosalind has inverted these photographs, and as in eyeballing, uh, you can here's one, here's an example. You can um, recognise these kind of rudimentary faces in them. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your use of found material or appropriated material. Um, could you say anything about what? attracts you to existing material and how you use it? Um, well, it used to be that I was always filming um, from reality and then in the sort of series of images that I would do, I was using appropriated images and making sequences with them. Um, and I think that I enjoyed the kind of different register because I think when you, you mainly make films, it's a very particular way of working where most of your time is not actually taken up in practice. Um, it's sort of researching something or, or, yeah, the editing process is quite long. The actual shooting, the actual really, the most active part of the practice is very short. So I sort of needed a, a, a more ongoing and cost-free way of working that I could do day to day. So I was working with images like that and enjoying using o appropriated images because I could um, twist them to my own sort of I'm interested in looking at an image and not 
using it for what's on the surface, but trying to get at something behind that I'm sort of projecting. Again, this idea of projection. But then recently I've actually, in one of the films here, used um, appropriated image from a film within my film and sort of reenacted it and then compared it with the original in the film. So I think I sort of use these things in order to interrogate why they're interesting to me. And a lot of my films are a sort of, because I, when I make them, I don't actually know what the result will be and I don't necessarily know why I've made certain decisions. The film itself is used to interrogate the decisions made. So I'll, in Batch of Machines Part 2, this two screen film that's in the show, I look at this um, appropriated piece of film by Alexander Kluger from the 60s, reenact that piece of film and put it alongside older films of mine and I sort of look at the whole thing as a way of trying to understand different strands of interest that were uh, I was having at that time when I was making it and try to investigate them. Actually, I'd like to ask about this film that we see in the back now, Footnotes. Um, it's a film of Thomas Barrell and his wife, Helke. And of course, Thomas Barrell is a famous artist, is always like in focus, but in your film, you have put his wife, uh, Helke, in focus. She's reading while her husband is sleeping. And he, while she's reading, uh, she is looking down, and every time she looks down and looks for the footnotes, this frog actually comes up in like a cut, like a cross. How important is it for you, the, and this also goes with other places where you use um, like actors, who they are in some, like we will talk to about later in, in Jack Strawcastle, you use your mother, here you use a famous artist. How important is that and what kind of... I think the only actors, non-actors, I don't have any, any actors, <clears throat> but the only non-actors that I have in my films are all people who I know well. So they're already playing a role. And I met Thomas in Norway, actually, when I was in Oslo doing a residency at Oka. He was doing a residency as well. And his wife was there with him. And... Um, it was just at a moment where I was actually looking for Alexander Kluger because I wanted to use this piece from his film. And I was in touch with him, but it was difficult to actually get to, to meet him. I'd met him briefly in London before, but it was difficult to pin him down. And then I met Thomas, who was from the same generation, from the same city, and had an incredibly interesting approach to life and work and way of speaking. And he became a, a really good surrogate in a way and I think in the films there's often um, people are playing sort of surrogate positions um, and so the first time I worked with him or used him in a work was for Bachelor Machines Part 2 where it's Thomas and his wife reenacting this scene and the second time I wanted to focus on Helka because I was very interested in her role. She's in this sort of fairly traditional role of the artist's wife. She supports him in his work. She helps him to make it and she travels with him. And she also does do her own um, praxis, which is um, video documentaries about artists. But it's mainly supporting him in his work. And even at 70, she was saying to me at one point, people off, my friends often ask me, why don't you concentrate on your own work? Why are you, uh, you know, standing behind your husband in this way and, and she says but they don't understand how instrumental my role is and how much we both get from my participation and so I became interested in the idea of, of Helka <clears throat> playing this role of reading in bed and having an experience on her own late at night where she reads the footnote and goes almost clicks into a different level of reality which is symbolized by the frog because I thought that it was a, almost a subversion to have her exhibiting her very private moment while the sort of, the, you know, the great artist filmmaker slept. Um, that this was an, a, a sort of moment of privacy for her and of visibility. And perhaps we should uh, reiterate again what you said at the start about the way these films are installed because the three films we've talked about so far, Eyeballing, Bachelor Machines Part 2, and Footnote, are all installed together in a gallery, kind of showing, well, Footnote's showing continuously, and then the other two are showing in rotation. 
um, and because footnote is silent, uh, the installation is able to encompass all three of these films and show show them as a family of work. Um, and I think that's a, a very kind of useful device. But do you want to say anything about your decision to install them in that way? Yeah, I mean, it's always a problem to turn galleries into sort of mini dark rooms. Um, so we didn't really want to do that in either case. So <clears throat> also wanted the works to sort of speak to each other in some way. So it's, you go into the gallery, footnote is playing on a smaller screen all the time. And that's just a very, very simple film, just a one minute loop of Halka reading and going through these different colors and experiencing the frog over and over. <clears throat> and then eyeballing comes on first, which is this 10 minute film of the cops and faces. And as that finishes, Batcha Machine t part two comes on at the other end of the room. And that incorporates, his, incorporates images from eyeballing as well as Thomas and Helka again, but with Thomas in the foreground this time. So the three works are sort of bouncing across each other around in the triangle around the room really. Um, and I was hoping in this way to sort of, <clears throat> that each one would be enhanced by the other in a way that that would cause more understanding of, of the things that I'm working with. Do you see your films as installations? Uh, sometimes, not always. Um, I've shown Batch Machines part one and part two in festivals and um, clearly Jack Straw's Castle could um, exist in a festival context or a screening context. Many of my films have been in screenings and festivals. A few, in this case, I've turned them into an installation. Uh, the Prisoner, which we haven't discussed yet, is very much an installation. And Bachelor Machines Part 2, by the nature of its being too screen, doesn't really work in screening context because you can't really have two projectors set up. Um, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. Let's talk a little bit out about our new commission, Jack Straw Castle. You, you said something about reality, going in and out of reality. And I, this is also a little bit of the core in Jack Straw Castle. It's different types of reality. One's, one is staged, one is for real. Uh, explain to us a little bit about that work, how it came about, the title, and so on. Um, well, the c title came sort of halfway through the making of the film, but um, the first thing... <clears throat> I need to get. <coughs> Excuse me. The first thing was that for um, about a year, I'd not been interested in. Let me have a drink. I've been interested in filming um, men cruising <coughs> in a public park. I don't know if you, that translates. Into. Man cruising in public parks. Do we need a translation to that? Do we understand what it okay. means? Um, Man cruising <laughs> in parks. So I've been interested in that for a while because um, sometimes in certain places, at, you know, come four or five o'clock in the evening or six, you suddenly might realize that you're the only woman and the, there's this sort of men popping up here and there and just find that amazing. I find that whole scene very... Um, Sort of, it's very exciting in one way. It's this very um, pastoral scene, quite beautiful, but also this sort of idea of the potential of of sex in this pastoral scene, and that these men are sort of looking for that, and um, <clears throat> something very um, obviously quite a primitive urge about that, but at the same time a very sophisticated set of ritualistic behaviours going with it, and those that sort of boundary interests me. Um, so I was interested in the way that the park comes alive with this desire at that certain time. And so it was started with that. <clears throat> when I say filming men cruising, I just literally mean the sort of hunt. I don't mean any acts going on. And then I decided to use the same site for uh, another sort of exhibition of desire in a way, which is a, a film... Um, crew setting up and lighting the site at night <coughs> so when the light goes in the same place um, this other community of men appear who are lighting 
the trees and turning it, turning this kind of already beautiful during the daytime pastoral scene into this very aestheticized, um, artificial kind of beautiful scene. And, and so for me, both the film is really in two halves, this cruising half and the film shoot half, and both halves speak of desire in different ways. Both Jack Straw's Castle and the other film in the second part of the show, The Prisoner, um, have, a very, have these elements of voyeurism in them. Um, how, I think it's interesting both at the ICA and here in Bergen, the show is very clearly in two parts with Jack Straw's Castle and The Prisoner, which kind of share these sexual themes. Um, how have people uh, reacted to that element of voyeurism within, well, particularly within Jack Straw's Castle? Not in the way that I thought they would. Um, I had thought, as you know, because I had some worries while I was making the film that... Um, on the one hand, I was worried about revealing people's identities, which I didn't want to do, and uh, causing kind of personal problems. On the other hand, I was worried about people objecting to my activities. And obviously, I didn't have permission in any way to film that. Um, but that's the normal way that I filmed all the things that I've done. Um, that hasn't been the case at all, in fact since I've shown the film, nobody has brought up a feeling of in inappropriateness or, or kind of a moral question about my activity. And I think probably because I was quite successful in, in concealing the identity of people and also because I think, and what some people have told me is that it sort of translates into a more general quest and almost like whether it be a search for sex or a, a quest for love or just a more general feeling of a search and a sort of um, a sexual charge with that but also almost like a kind of pastoral scene or a tapestry or something with, with people emerging from trees so it's very kind of uh, it, it doesn't give a sort of I, I don't know because I'm too close to the work but I don't feel that it gives a voyeuristic feeling um, the prisoner is a lot more set up to be about perhaps about voyeurism in cinema because it's a film of um, of the camera following a woman in high heels and that's a stage scenario um, it's a friend of mine and I asked her to, to do that um, I suppose that in those two films what people have re responded to is the feeling of, of the cinematic, and I think that's to do with a certain structure in the film, or a certain use of desire in the film, rather than voyeurism. But I'm, yeah, it's not really something that I feel I can answer because it's for the viewer to decide. This film is then too; it's um, synchronized, 16 millimeter construction, quite complicated, um, technical wise. Don't worry. <laughs> But I think we got it up. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a woman that has sort of been followed by herself. She's walking. She's walking during the, it's in the streets of London. And it's like the machines are following each other. And the woman, like the two women, is actually following each other. Um, Mark, fill me in while I'm finding my next question. <laughs> well, this is a very... Um in a way, it's a very formal piece. Um, it, it's a very formal exploration of cinema and its properties. And one of the interesting things about it is how it turns a physical distance, the distance between the two projectors, and the film has to travel from one to the other. And it expresses that as a kind of time lag between the two projected images. Um, it's a very kind of elegant formal piece as well as um, one which introduces and it uh, continues the exploration of various of these themes about um, ritual and performance which feature in Rosalind's work. Um, one thing I was very aware of seeing um, The Prisoner and Jack Straw's Castle here is the way that elements of performance and staging 
um, have become increasingly important, and you see that over the sequence of works within this exhibition. Um, but I guess Jack Straw's Castle does something it, it has, we didn't really kind of talk about the structure of it perhaps uh, very clearly, but it has two very distinct parts. The first part is all these, this kind of candid uh, footage um, of kind of uh, real events. And then the second part is this kind of staged scenario. And then the two start um, sort of reflecting on each other in very interesting ways. And I wondered if you could say something about that. I think when I first encountered Rosalind's work, it was often talked about in terms of documentary traditions or anthropological filmmaking or observational work. Um, but I think um, the, the practice has in fact, though it often still includes elements of those, it's, be it's become evident that it has many other engagements as well, it has a very strong engagement with cinema um, and a very strong engagement with performance, which were not things were necessarily so clear when I first encountered the work. Um, and I wondered if you could say something about that, whether that was just a shift in people, how people understood the work, or whether that was a shift in the work itself. Um, well, eyeballing marked um, a sort of watershed for me, because up until then, I was making films which were purely observational in the way that they were shot, of usually closed communities um, or communities within institutions, so groups of people and how they interacted in a particular neighborhood or in hospital or um, in a family, an extended family living in one house. And I, I went quite a sort of long way down the road with that, and I felt, to me, that it was that I was making films about where the everyday becomes more sort of transformed into something <clears throat> more performative or ritualistic or even more sort of miraculous from ordinary using reality in order to sort of show where reality kind of clicks into another register which is more um, to do with archetypal behavior. <clears throat> but... Um, that wasn't really the work, the way that the work was being read, because the real nature of of the um, material and the very, what I felt I was doing was sort of acting as a very, very particular filter um, by the way I shot things and the things that I shot. But in a way, the openness of the film allowed people just to focus on the people and the activities and and the documentary um, aspects, and that was a bit unsatisfactory to me because. I realized the work wasn't really doing what I was interested in it doing. So that's why in eyeballing I admitted any sort of individual people and instead used this very, very reduced um, formula for a face, which in its absolute stripped down nature, um, we end up investing more emotional meaning into. So like two windows and a door become very sad or very funny or very bizarre. <coughs> And um, cops in uniform, which are again like absolute negation in a way of the individual and just symbolizing this control um, and this sense of, of being monitored. Um, so I tried to be clearer about my intentions in how I um, was making the work from then on. And I also worked in a more intuitive way although I mean I think I was working in an intuitive way anyway but I was using so much of what was already there and now I was beginning to sort of shape things more and, and to sort of risk a little bit more to say these are the things I'm interested in and I'm at this point I don't necessarily know why and it's very important to start making a film about <clears throat> cops and faces or about cruising and, and filmmaking without knowing what the connection between those things are in order to investigate while making films and work in an intuitive way. Soon your <coughs> voice will rest. We're just going to ask some few questions and spare it for the audience as well. Um, I just have a question on uh, exactly a little bit on what you said now. It's um, your films are not very narrative. You don't tell stories in the you know traditional sense. So in that's in, in that opinion, or in that sense, audience have to sort of 
either just accept what you give to them or try to research what is the history back or like the, um, the story behind it. How dependent or how do you think of this information, you know, the police, the story of Jack Straw Castle with men walking around, because you can't really see that necessarily in the film first. You see it, you know, take some time. But how, how do you think of that information to the audience? Do, would you like it to be there or would you rather not? Would you like not to I mean, reveal I, it? I, um, no, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I feel that the films do the talking. Um, I feel that you do get the picture after sort of two minutes into Jack Straw's castle. But it's important that it's revealed bit by bit. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you know when you start watching that film that there's going to be men cruising or not, because once you're into it, you get this sort of introduction of trees and eventually you see somebody pop up here and somebody pop up there. And after a while, you realize that they're men whose paths are crossing. So there's a sort of pleasure that I want to gain from that kind of way of revealing things to the viewer, a sort of pleasure in discovery and in, in you thinking you you sort of you sort of understanding what you're seeing over time. But I like to think that the films work without text around them. Maybe footnote has been a bit of a confusing one, but it's just one minute long and it's very simple. <laughs> yes, I had a question I thought about when I was walking here, which was um, whether you think of yourself as a conceptual artist. Because it seems these days that everyone has to be a conceptual artist. It's like no one is allowed to be anything else. Um, but actually, it seems to me you could more accurately describe your practice as being that of a, a poetic artist. Say, there's much, you talked about intuition, there's also a very s strong use of uh, association and associative linking rather than necessarily um, the sort of logical procedures which we'd associate with a with a conceptual practice um, yeah I would I would say that I probably am not a conceptual art no and I think um, I yeah I'm really interested at the point at which my knowledge stops and you know or not I mean, I think the knowledge is there. I think the thing is that it's it's not articulated in terms of clear thoughts. And I think when I start making a film and I have something I want to do, I do trust myself and allow myself to do it because I feel that there is some sort of negative space in a way of knowledge that needs to be filled in by making the film. And the fact that there's this gap in what I know, to me, indicates that there's something to be found. So I don't start from a position of, having a formula which I wish to translate into an artwork, I start really much from the position of <clears throat> wanting to make associations or wanting to wanting to sort of um, try something and see then in the editing process becomes more analytical. What is this doing? What, what parts of this are working? And maybe why, why was I there in the first place? So this is, I wouldn't say it was, it was a logical practice and most of what we talk about work, you know, even conceptual artists, is comes after the making of the work, I think. Um, but certainly with me, this is important to not know when I begin that whether there's a film at the end of it or not, you know. I think we're going to, if you don't have more on your page, I think we're going to open up for the audience. If you might have some question for Rosie or... Any questions? Everything very clear? No questions. So I think actually we're going to, if you don't have a last one, you look like you wanted to say something, Mark. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, was just, I was just trying to think, uh, yes, any advice for young artists, filmmakers out there? I'm good. <laughs> Whatever I say is going to sound really cheesy now. <laughs> Just keep doing what you do. <laughs> Don't get a job. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, thank you very much, both of you. And thank you for coming. Give an applause to Rosie and Mark. Thank you very much for inviting me.
And um, so, what time is it now? What, does anyone have the time? 7.30, so you have like half an hour to relax and have a drink and go and see the show at 8. Thank you so much. <laughs>